Hello and welcome to section 6.2, Exponential Functions and Their Graphs. So far in your math careers, you guys have looked at uh, algebraic functions, and now we're going to start looking at a set of functions called transcendental functions, okay, which include exponential and log functions. So today we're going to kind of focus on exponential functions. Exponential functions are going to look something like what you see here. It's in the form of f of x equals a to the x. Notice the exponent is the variable and your base of that exponent is going to be some value that's going to be greater than zero but not equal to one. And your x value or your variable can be any real number. Typically we don't want a to be one because if a was actually the number one, I would really have one to the x so then it wouldn't matter what I plugged in for x, I would still get the value of 1. So that's why your a can't be 1. So a few more properties that we can use uh, to solve exponents, or that are kind of unique to exponents, um, as long as your a value or that base is greater than 0, then the following statements are going to be true. So your exponent a to the x is going to be a unique real number for each real number x. If a to the b equals a to the c, then we know that a, or sorry, b and c, or the two exponents, have to also be equal. That's a property we're going to use in a couple examples. If you have the same base, a, and you're looking at your exponents, if the exponent m is less than n, then I know that a to the m is going to be less than a to the n. Again, assuming our bases are the same and their value that's greater than one. And finally, if m is less than n, when notice here, this a is going to be in between zero and one. So if your bases are a number between zero and one, and your exponent m is less than n, then that means that a to the m is going to be greater than a to the n. And again, we'll look at a few examples of those here in a few moments. Now, example one is just for you to kind of get a little bit of a feel for how to type these in on your calculator and just to show you um, how or, or kind of what happens when we change our exponent and our base value. So for part A, we have 8 to the x, and in this case, we're going to plug in pi. So I really have 8 to the power of pi. When I type that in my calculator, you should get something that's approximately equal to 687. 0.29, and it looks like I got 291, is we're all around that. If I raise my same base of 8 to a negative 1 half power, so I'm going to put a negative 1 half um, on my calculator, notice I'm going to get a value out that is going to be less than 1, or I got 0.35. 3, 6 on my calculator. And now for part C, if I take that point 8, so I have a number that's in between 0 and 1 for my base, and I raise that to a negative 2.5, I'm going to get something that's approximately equal to 1.7469. So just make sure that you type a couple of these into your calculator and that you know how to do these. Now, I have a couple examples of some graphs, and I want you to kind of pay attention to what's going to be changing. So for this first one here, and you can do this on your calculator, um, you'll see here that they have kind of like a little table drawn, so you can do a table if you don't have a calculator at home. Um, I don't care how you do it, um, I just kind of want you to get the idea of what's going on inside of that graph. So for this here, it says we're looking at values of A that are greater than one. So right here, this f of x equals 2 to the x, that base a is greater than 1, and if you were to just graph that, you're going to get a graph that looks something like this. Now a few things to notice. Notice that your y-intercept is at the point, and we can write this on there, it's at 0, 1. We can see that our graph, um, as I go from left to right, is kind of increasing. Um, it is ex increasing in what we call exponential fashion. Okay, so it's increasing at a faster and faster rate. Um, 
our domain, I can plug in negative numbers, I can plug in positive numbers, I can plug in zeros, fractions. So our domain then is going to be from negative infinity to infinity, or all real numbers. But my range, if you notice, it kind of looks like this graph is approaching the, hor the horizontal axis or the x-axis. So my range is going to be from zero to infinity, or all numbers greater than zero. Now when we look at our next graph, here we have uh, the graph of g of x, which our a value is going to be in between zero and one, or a fraction. So here I have one half to the power of x, and again, graph it on your calculator, your Desmos, or create a table, but notice how your graph changes, okay? There's a few similarities. My graph is still gonna go through zero, one for my y-intercept, but this graph here, notice it's decreasing exponentially. Um, my domain, I can still have positives, negatives, zeros, fractions. So my domain is going to be all real numbers. And my range, just like on the previous example, this graph is also approaching that horizontal axis or the x-axis. So I still have to stay above zero. So my graph is going to be zero to infinity on this one as well. So to kind of recap what we just looked at, if my a value is greater than one, we get a function that's increasing and continuous on the entire domain. Uh, based on what we covered in section 3.1, this graph here will pass the horizontal line test. So we can say that this function is one to one, which means it's going to have a, an, an inverse function. Um, we have a horizontal asymptote, so as x approaches um, a negative infinity, our y values are approaching zero, uh, and we know that the graph is going to pass through the coordinate point zero, one. Now, when we start looking at changing things in the exponent um, or outside of the actual function itself, it's kind of like when we were looking at linear and quadratic functions earlier in the year. So here's a graph um, that has two functions. The main one um, you can see is just y equals 2 to the x, so that's kind of like this black or grayish color line here. And notice if I go ahead and I add um, inside of the function itself, or I have 2 to the x plus 3, notice how that's going to shift our graph. So here it shifts our graph left three units. Okay, and that's because, again, we're adding 3 inside of the function itself. Our domain is still going to be all real numbers, and our range is going to be all real numbers greater than 0. So the domain and range stay the same. We just shift our graph to the left, 3. Now looking at this example, we can see that we have two to the x, but outside of that, we're going to be adding three. So what this is gonna do is that adding three outside of our function is going to shift our graph upwards three units. So we're going to shift up three units. And so then our domain is still going to be all real numbers, but our range now is going to be all real numbers greater than three, or you can write this as three to infinity. Likewise, remember all real numbers is from negative infinity to infinity as well. Okay, and like we saw on one of the previous examples, um, the exponential functions are going to be um, one to one because they do pass the horizontal line test. Uh, and as long as a is greater than zero, but not equal to one, if I have two um, powers, so if I have a to the x equals a to the y, then we know that x has to equal y. So we're gonna use that property here to look at our next example. So now in example two, we're gonna use that property to help us solve for x. So because I noticed that x is in my um, exponent, I need to somehow get both of these so that they are in the form of the same um, power. So that means I want their bases to be the same. Once their bases are the same, I can set their exponents equal to one another and then solve for my x. So how this is going to work is when I look at 16, hopefully we know or we could figure out 
that 2 to the power of 4 really equals 16. And I also have 2 to the power of x plus 2. That's just given. So now that both of my bases are the same, what I can do then is I can take my exponents and set them equal to each other so I can continue on to solve for x. So now if I subtract 2 from both sides, I can see that x is really equal to 2. Now just to double check your work, if I go back and I go and I plug in, I have 2 to the 2 plus 2, that really gives me 2 to the 4th, and 2 to the 4th is really 16, which is what I started out with right here. So here, my solution is x is equal to 2. Okay, and part b is going to be very similar. Um, you can do this in one of two ways. Um, my, my base is really one third on the inside. So what I'm going to do is I know that if I make my exponent negative, I can actually reciprocate that one third. So if I take that one third and I raise that to the negative x, that's really going to give me um, one third raised to the power of x. So I'm going to leave or write my or rewrite that one as 3 to the negative x. And then I also know, and hopefully you do, or you could figure it out quickly as well, if I take 3 and I raise it to the fourth power, that I will get 81. So now what I've got is I've got negative x and 4 as being the only thing that's different, so I can set them equal to each other. So negative x equals 4. This tells me that x really equals negative 4. And then if I want to double check my work, if I take that 1 third and I raise it to the negative 4th power, properties of exponents tell me that I have to distribute that onto both the numerator. So I really have 4 to the negative, um, 4, or sorry, 1 to the negative 4th divided by, and I distribute it down here, 3 to the negative 4th. Well, the negative exponents tell me that I'm in the wrong spot or that I need to switch my numerator and denominator around. So that really gives me 3 to the positive 4th divided by 1 to the positive 4th, or 81 over 1, which really gives me 81. And that's exactly what I had right here. For example 3, it says describe the transformations of the graph. So for part A, um, I have a positive number that's greater than 1. So I know that my graph is going to be increasing. I know that it's going to go through the y-intercept of 0, 1. My domain is going to be all real numbers. And my range is going to be um, from 0 to infinity, or all real numbers greater than 0. Now for part b, I have a graph that's 4 to the x minus 2 because this right here, or the subtraction of 2, is actually inside of the function. That's actually going to shift my graph. So it's going to shift my graph to the right two units. Um, our domain is still going to be all real numbers. And our range is still going to be um, all real numbers greater than 0. We're no longer going to go through 0, 1 because we've shifted this graph um, left or right, but everything else should still hold true. Now the final thing we're going to talk about is um, what we call natural base e. And this oftentimes comes up when we're looking at exponential functions. Um, e is actually a number. It's kind of like uh, pi. Uh, it's an irrational number that's going to continue on. Uh, if you look at your calculator, there should be a lowercase e button on it. And when you hit that, it should say 2.718281 and continue on. Um, you might even have a button, um, like that would be like e to the first. Some calculators have an e, and then they'll give you a little box here, and then you can write you know, you could go e to the second, e to the third, or whatever. Um, so if you have a button that looks something like this, you might just have to go and type a 1 in for the exponent to get this number here. Um, but I think um, the calculators that we have in our classroom, I know have just an e button um, that you can just punch, and it's 
It's just that number E. Okay, so E is a constant um, in this. Uh, like I said, it, it represents this number here. When we have the function f of x equals e to the x, um, x is actually the variable in this situation, and e is, like I said, it has a numerical value. So for example four, I would like you to find that e button and just evaluate e to the power of 6.2. When you do that, you should get something that's approximately equal to, uh, looks like I got 492, 0.749, um, if you evaluate part B, which is e to the negative 7.1, you should get something close to, I got point, and it looks like there are three zeros, and then an eight. If you're having issues with this, please let me know. So one of the most common types of problems that you're gonna see when we're dealing with exponential functions is what we call um, compounded interest and continuously compounded interest. So when we have compound interest, we actually have two different types that we're gonna look at. One is co called continuously compounded. That means you're getting interest on interest and it's just, it's constantly um, being compounded, okay? This creates what we call like the per equation. So it's your principal times E raised to the power of rate times your time. And then we also have um, a situation where you are compounding it so many times per year. So this could be like a quarterly, it could be a monthly, um, it could be a daily. Uh, you know, you have to be given that information. But regardless of what equation we're looking at, our T is always going to be time measured in years. A is going to be the account balance after um, the interest has been applied. P is going to be your principal, and R is going to be your rate as it's a percentage usually. You're gonna compound it like at 5% for three years. Um, so the rate is always going to go into decimal form. So let's take a quick look at an example or, or a couple examples to see how this works. So for example five, it says one, or I should say on the day of a child's birth, a deposit of $25,000 was made in a trust fund that pays eight and a quarter percent interest. We want to find the balance in the account on the child's 26th birthday if interest is compounded in three different ways. Okay, so for the first one, or actually the first two, notice it's telling us that we're compounding quarterly and monthly. So because quarterly and monthly are going to be so many times per year, quarterly is going to be four times per year, monthly would be 12 times per year, we're actually going to use the formula A equals, and this is on the previous slide, so A equals P times one plus R over N raised to the power of N T. So for a quarterly um, compounded interest, we're gonna end up with A equals, our principal is going to be $25,000, or your starting amount. Then I'm gonna have one plus, R is my rate as a decimal, so 0 0.0825, divided by N. N is the number of times it's being compounded. Well, quarterly we said was four, and we're gonna raise that to the power of N, which we just said was four, times T. T is our time in years, or in 26 years. So if you type all of this in on your calculator, you should see that in 26 years, with interest being compounded quarterly, that $25,000 is gonna turn into $208,941.65. Okay, again, that's being compounded quarterly. <clears throat> now, if we go and look at monthly, monthly is going to be a very similar setup. So I'm going to start out with my $25,000. I have one plus. My interest rate is still the same. But now, instead of compounding it four times a year, we're actually going to compound it 12 times a year. So I'm going to divide this by 12. And then in my exponent, I'm going to have 12 for my n and I'm still doing this over 26 years. 
So now if we go from four times a year to 12 times a year, this is gonna make that child $211,989.34. Okay, so those are um, being compounded like quarterly, monthly, daily, anything but continuously pretty much. So part C here, we're compounding this continuously. So when you see that word continuously, this is what we call the PERT formula, or A equals PE to the RT. So for this one, uh, we'll switch this over to green. If we do this continuously, we're gonna take our $25,000 investment, multiply it by E, my interest rate is still 0 0.0825, and we're gonna multiply that by 26 years. When you um, compound it this much, this child will now earn $213,551.03. So you can see that the compounded continuously is actually gonna bring in a little bit more money at the same rate for the same amount of time. Please let me know if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, I hope you have a great day and I will talk to you later. Thanks.